do you think it's important that you teach your daughter basic kind of situational awareness? 100%. Absolutely. Okay. What would you say about a father who did not do that? They aren't personally responsible, and they're leading to a situation where their loved one, their daughter, could be hurt severely. And I, I, I think a lot of women get a lot of different propaganda today that's very dangerous to them. There's a lot of entertainment that puts in a lot of subliminal kind of context and messaging in there that creates a form of delusion that is absolutely reckless, that is absolutely dangerous. And if you truly do care about women, you would care about self-defense rights, and, and you would care about the ability to defend yourself, which in places like New York City, you don't have that ability to okay. do. So what is your response to a woman who would say, well, I shouldn't have to defend myself. It's 2024. Uh, men shouldn't be doing this anymore. Let's hear that message in New Delhi, India. Let's hear that message in a lot of other Latin American countries. Let's hear that message in, in Saudi Arabia, as, of course, uh, a lot of those individuals are uh, literally being walked in, into the United States with the Biden administration and their kind of policies. Welcome to Conversation with Peter Bogosian. I just had a great conversation with Luke Gordkowski, who's an independent journalist and very, very popular YouTuber. I was on his show. He came in on for conversations with Peter Bogosian, and we talked about self-defense. We talked about liberty. We talked about freedom. We talked about friendship. It was a really good conversation, and Luke's a good dude, and I hope you enjoy the show. Thanks. Peter. Luke Gordkowski, thanks for letting me use your studio. Welcome to Conversations with Peter Bogosian. How are you doing? Absolutely. You know, we just had a very awesome, fascinating yeah, conversation. It was a good conversation. It was really fun. It was kind of in the weeds. It was it was all over the place, but also kind of centered towards uh, just our kind of honest inquiry towards yeah. finding out what's really happening in this world. So it was fun. Thank you so much for, for having me oh, on. Oh, I appreciate you, you having me. I appreciate that. Okay, so we're in Miami, Florida right now, and you're in my. How long have you lived in Miami? Um, I've, I've been coming down here for quite a while. This has been my first year in Miami, and I absolutely love it. From it's, where? Uh, from uh, the um, uh, essentially refuge of running away from New York City. Oh. During COVID, I, w I was there. I was kind of grounded. Before COVID, I was running around the world. I was able to travel hack and figure out a way how to travel around the world for essentially free. And uh, that's where a lot of my on the ground reporting came from all over the world. And COVID happened and it kind of just stopped me from being able to do that. What, what do you love? OK, so I want to ask about your background. But what do you love about Miami? Uh, the people, the weather, the, the beach, the nature, the, the, the right to defend yourself, the, the very little taxes, the, the ability to uh, just have a life that is worth living. You know, you go to a lot of other places, the people and the population are beat up. There's an aspect here of enjoying yourself. There's an aspect here of going to restaurants, of, of talking to people, meeting people, celebrating mm. life, enjoying life. Oh. There's a superficial aspect to it as well because you got the fake big butts and you got the fake big boobs everywhere. Uh, but but I, I would say that's a little bit better to be around than, of course, the blue armpit hair New York City crazy people who are kind of downtrodden, beat up, and, and dealing with essentially Stockholm syndrome of living in such an abusive place that takes advantage of them and robs them of all of their wealth and money through taxation, which is really theft. Here in Miami, um, you kind of have the opposite of that. You, you do still have that superficial aspect, but you, but you still have this kind of celebration of beauty. And whatever well, you might think well. about it, it's, it's in its full kind of blossom here uh, on full display. And it's really awesome to people watch. It's really awesome to walk around. And it's really awesome to kind of shift your lifestyle towards a more healthier uh, lifestyle that uh, definitely does serve me a lot better than New York City did before. Wow, what a, what a convincing answer. I just had, had drinks with Dave Rubin last night, and he gave a very similar answer. Uh, you plan on staying here for a while, I assume? Absolutely. To me, Florida is the Alamo. This is like the last really? kind of state standing up for a lot of individual freedoms, a lot of individual liberties. I, I, I think even though the, the kind of record was mixed, I, I think their response to COVID was extremely bold, extremely brave. Everyone said that Florida was going to lead a genocide against the, all the elderly people that live here. Everyone criticized this state, but I think if it wasn't for... Uh, Ron DeSantis, Dana White, and all these other individuals making steps towards mm. personal liberty and personal responsibility that uh, the, the country and the nation and the world would have been far off worse. They were the first people that said, we're going to make a bold move here. We're going to be the experiment. We're going to take the risk because we believe in personal liberty. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I 
Florida is bigger bigger than the country of England in terms of mass. Um, I didn't I didn't really I've intentionally stayed out of the COVID stuff because I have no medical expertise. But t tell me a couple of minutes, if you don't mind. Just give me your, your background. is fascinating. Just give me like two minutes of your background. I was born and partly raised in uh, Poland. And then my family fled and uh, eventually was able to ship me out of Poland and then get me to New York City. I was raised in Brooklyn in, in the 90s. Uh, uh, definitely uh, a wild place, a crazy place. Uh, I think it was 1992 or 1993 that I ended up in, in Brooklyn. Growing, growing up in New York City, I was there, uh, of course, like everyone else living there during 9-11. Those, played, uh, th those events played a very key central role towards me being who I am today. Um, you, you discovered a larger kind of police state apparatus afterwards. You, you also noticed a large significant number of individuals that were told that the air was safe to breathe when it wasn't. And that was the kind of major big lie that kind of exposed a lot of the larger kind of inner workings, the kind of secrecy and the kind of really horrible behaviors within government that that hurt people, hurt their own people, hurt service members of this country, hurt firefighters, police officers, military men that came down there to rescue people that were lied to. Those lives could have been saved. Those lives could have been uh, protected. They weren't because the government lied to everyone and, and deliberately told everyone, you know, no, all the face masks you have and all the, all the respiratory gear you have, all the PPE you have, don't worry about it. You're, it's totally safe. And they altered medical documents with Christy Todd Whitman, with the George W. Bush White House, and then with the corporate media regurgitated that lie and uh, affected a lot of people, a lot of people that I knew, a lot of people that I lost, and that kind of set me on my own journey of questioning you everything. Uh, it, you know, there was individuals uh, like Greg Quibell, individuals that uh, were a part of the John Feelgood Foundation that were uh, rescue workers that came to the pile uh, at Ground Zero after 9-11, trying to help people, trying to save people. And then they dealt with uh, sicknesses and ailments that uh, medical professionals have never seen before, that they couldn't really kind of understand. <laughs> Uh, Atlas, calm down. It's fine. Atlas is it's, it's Atlas okay. is good to go. Yeah, we're, we're cool. That's good. That adds she's character ready. to your uh, Atlas couch, please. But but more importantly, um, a lot of this was related to the asbestos that was in the buildings. Um, the World Trade Center towers were filled with a lot of asbestos. And uh, other side, please. Thank you. Uh, a lot of the uh, asbestos was actually talked about a lot in the corporate media right before 9-11. And they actually described how it would be more expensive to get rid of the asbestos than to even demolish the buildings before 9-11. There was even major publications talking about how they were huge white elephants and how they were filled with all these horrible substances that were banned and that they needed to get rid of. And it would have been an astronomical cost in order to do so. It, does the government do anything, the U.S. government do anything that's good? Because you seem down on yes, the government. Absolutely. Okay, what do they do that's No, no, good? no. I'm saying yes, they don't oh, do it. Oh, oh, they don't. oh okay. <laughs> that, but, but this is just my kind of knee-jerk reaction uh, to your question. I, I, I do believe in the con kind of Ron Swanson political approach yeah. that okay. the best government is no government. Mm. Uh, that's just my own kind of personal belief, personal viewpoint, mainly because I, I think it also speaks a lot to me being Polish and my heritage and my family and what they went through. The Polish people were routinely uh, attacked and abused from elements of the far right and elements of the far left. We have seen how horrible both of these kind of a larger political ideologies could be towards human freedom, liberty, and life. And I, I think naturally we have a, a automatic kind of repelling of any idea that government could come in and kind of help you. Why are liberty and freedom important? I, I think they're the things that give us life. They're the things that give us meaning. God gave us free will. And if we don't have the ability to use that free will, they essentially have taken a key component away from us of, of this existence that we all share here on this earth. So free speech is the most important aspect towards a free society, but towards not just a free people, but, but towards a free existence. Life is short, and it's best lived when you're able to, of course, test things, talk about things, challenge things. Living in a repressive state, a lot of, like a lot of people have throughout human history, 
is uh, is is not is, is not something we should glorify. It's not something we should uh, promote. It's not something that we should normalize. I, I think humanity works best when it's allowed to use the scientific method, when it's allowed to discover things, when it's allowed to invent things, when it's allowed to kind of fix its own problems. And you could correlate historically a lot of human prosperity many times with human personal liberty and freedom. And I think having that aspect, having that ability to actually live your life like you want, as long as you're not hurting anyone or, or stealing from anyone, uh, essentially living by the non-aggression principle is something that I think we should be striving for. And if enough people kind of believed in it, I, I think it's an idea that is just crazy enough that it, it's possible. It's plausible enough to, to make a reality. If I had a magic wand and I waved it and... You could be 25 IQ points smarter, but you'd have to give up freedom of assembly. Would you do it? For me or for everyone for else? For you. That's a very hard question. I would, I would have to pontificate on that for a while. I mean, 25 IQ points, that's a lot of IQ points. It is. The right to peacefully assembly, the right for to, to me to be able to, to kind of speak to people and to organize people is something also that's very important to me. Um, it, it would be something that I, I, it, I would automatically knee jerk reactions and none of them. I don't want to choose, but if I have to choose, a, if I have, a, you know, a gun to my head, um, that it's, it's, it's very, it's a very hard. Would one. you give up five IQ points to give up your Miranda rights? I don't want to give up any rights. Uh, would you, would you, would <laughs> you get five IQ points to give up your Miranda rights? Excuse me. I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want that set to set the president. I, I, I think right. if people were watching and paying attention to this, I think it would be important to thinking about this uh, kind of automatically. It, it would be better to, to represent um, an idea that helps out everyone else, not just yourself. Do you think all people yearn to be free? Like, do you think freedom no. is a universal... No, I, 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 I don't think they do. I think people thrive when they're free. But do people want freedom? No. Sometimes they want big daddy government coming in and, and ruling their lives. Sometimes they want government coming in and giving them, them the illusion of, of safety and security. Um, so, you know, there's, there's different people out there with different wants and different needs. I just think that uh, people who want to be kind of left alone, people who want to fend for themselves, people who want to be responsible for themselves as long as they're not hurting anyone, I think they should have the right to do it. So freedom is not a human universal. It's like, is, it, is freedom a universal human good? I believe so. Uh, but it, is it something that people kind of want? Not everyone. So if they don't want it, if freedom is a universal human good and someone doesn't want to want freedom... How do you, you give them freedom? How do you force wrong? them... Um, I, I think there are definitely um, individuals that we should talk to, that we should reach out to, that we should try to convince that, hey, maybe giving up all of your responsibilities to someone who doesn't care about you isn't the best of ideas. Um, that, that maybe that if you take personal responsibility, maybe you can make decisions in your life that, of course, are more advantageous for you and your family and your community. Mm -hmm. um, and I think those choices usually are. So I think it would take convincing, but you, you can't force someone to want freedom. You can't force someone to be free. They kind of have to want it and exemplify it and, and live it as best as they can. And that's personally what I'm trying to do, even though I do it in an imperfect way, even though I have my own kind of process, even though I have my own kind of uh, ways of uh, not being totally perfect. No one's per perfect, but I think humanity thrives and, and builds and grows and prospers with freedom. And I think that's something that I strive for, and I think that's something that uh, naturally is kind of inherent in the human spirit. It's, it's to adventure, it's to discover, it's to travel, it's to, yeah. it's to yeah. go out there into the world and, and then find, find out about it. What, what do you think, if, uh, if I remember the quotation correctly from Eric Fromm, people don't want the freedom to choose, they want the freedom from choice. That's a very interesting kind of quote there. Um, I would I would automatically kind of disagree with that. I don't I don't, I don't think um, I don't think that's that's true. I I, I think in, individually the, this human spirit this this thing that we all have intrinsically within us is is something that kind of is is realized once people start taking actions for themselves. Once you start thinking about yourself, your family, your community. 
you start being more individually focused towards the larger ideas of, of freedom and, and liberty and understand that a lot of the things that uh, are, are standing in its way take away from your existence in this life. I've been intermittent fasting for years. What doesn't get talked about enough is the longevity and weight health benefits of fasting, particularly for me as I have Crohn's disease. When you fast, your body turns its defense mechanisms on telling itself to hunker down and prepare to fight off illness and diseases. But it takes approximately three days of starving yourself to activate this process. Recent evidence shows that certain molecules that can turn these processes on in your body without actually having to fast exist. That's why I use Clean Being by Verso. It's formulated with scientifically proven ingredients to trick your body into thinking it's fasting even when you're not boosting your protection against illnesses and diseases. After taking clean being for some time, I've noticed a new spry in my step. Verso publishes third-party testing from each batch produced to guarantee you are getting what you pay for. Click the link in the description or head over to Verso and use coupon code PETER at checkout to save 15% on your first order. Thank you. Do you think long-term societies that are not free are less sustainable than societies that are? Yes, absolutely. Um, some people are making the argument now that, that China is, is an example that contradicts this larger idea. That, yeah. uh, but China, again, has, has a lot of problems internally as well, specifically when it comes to larger economic issues, uh, larger social issues. If you look at China and its one-child policy that was kind of instituted by the Rockefellers and the Ted Turners, they have created an unsustainable situation for the people living there where they're, they're facing a major civilizational population crash. There's way too many males, not enough females, and they're, they're facing significant mm. pressures on their entire empire that isn't as big as a lot of people make them out to be. Now, they are, they are smart. They are making some really kind of genius moves when it comes to the Belt and Road Initiative, when it comes to yeah, yeah. their larger kind of trade deals, when it comes to making their larger marker on international trade. But domestically, I, I do believe that they're shooting themselves in the foot by stopping a lot of free speech, stopping a lot of innovation, allowing companies to have monopolies, companies that are controlled in part by the government there that do stifle a lot of the progress that would have been happening, that would have helped humanity if it wasn't for the government standing there and saying, no, you can't say this. You can't express these ideas. You can't do this because you there question my money, my interest. Yeah, yeah. This is our monopoly, not yours. Therefore, we're going to put you in jail forever or torture you or uh, harvest your organs. What's the best argument you could give somebody for why they should care about their own freedom? Because when you do, life starts being incredible. It starts being sort of like a video game. It starts being a, a challenge. It's not easy doing this. We're asking people oh. to, to do something that it's, it's extremely inconvenient for a lot of people. It's extremely uh, uncomfortable for a lot of people. But through that un uncomfortability, there's growth. There's, there's uh, an ability to challenge yourself. There's an ability to push through difficult situations and truly make something out of yourself. Because the opposite of, of, of freedom, uh, essentially, is, is enslavement. It's total control. It's, it's centralization. It's, it's, it's communism. It's governments doing everything for you and you living a, a cruddy life where everything allegedly is provided for you when, it, when, it, when it's not. You providing for yourself, you get a sense of what this life really is about. Y your sense of accomplishment, your sense of building something, your, your kind of pathway in life saying, I did this on my own. I was able to accomplish this. I was able to do this on my own through uh, the, the larger hard work. W when you kind of look at life, that's the things that you appreciate the most. You don't appreciate things when they give it to you. You appreciate things when you work hard for them. It's kind of like John Kavanaugh, a Conor McGregor's coach, put this on Twitter. It's kind of like shelling the, uh, what are those little things called, the pistachios? Uh, it's like shelling the pistachios. If you just buy the pistachios without, there's something about taking off the shell that makes eating the pistachios better. Absolutely. There's something about building. There's something about making something. There's something about challenging yourself and growing and becoming better, bigger, and stronger through that process, that's incredible. That's amazing. That that really is the epitome of enjoying and living life to the fullest. And if, if you're someone who 
literally wants everything done for you by the, the government, just go to pr prison, just go to jail. Uh, thriving LGBT community there. They take care of your, your, your living conditions. <laughs> they take care of your food. They, they take care of you. They, they do everything for you. They, they tell you in the shower. They tell you when I wake up. All these central controlling leftist uh, pinko commies go to prison, go to jail, and enjoy your, your beautiful government-funded life that they're calling for everyone to live under in the United States. Okay, so relate either everything you said Relate some of the things you said to the f fact, and I, I will say the fact, that right now we live in a culture that glorifies victimhood, the yes. victim mentality. Yeah, I remember speaking out against this in, in the kind of early phases of this. Uh, in the, um, I think it was 2008, 2009, 2010, I was seeing this kind of trend that was worrisome because you saw people kind of be victimized and then kind of use it for online currency, use it for clicks, use it for a way to raise money and to, and to uh, you know, raise attention. That, that's something that, that has been very troubling because it's the exact opposite of what I was just preaching about a couple moments ago. And there was particular, uh, particularly a lot of situations where a lot of content creators uh, w would do a lot of really crazy, reckless things where they knew there was going to be some kind of you know, consequences for those actions. And um, w once you have this kind of glorification of, of, of someone who is hurt or their emotions are hurt or their feelings are hurt, you have someone that there's, there's a kind of natural human instinct to be like, hey, oh, it's okay, we'll take care of you, we'll do that. But once you have someone creating a lot of fake scenarios and circumstances just to kind of galvanize and weaponize that kind of caring and consideration by some human beings, you, you truly have a downward spiral that is leading us to just people doing the opposite of taking personal responsibility for themselves. And, and that is, of, of course, seeking attention, seeking help, demanding help, and putting themselves in situations where they weigh everyone else down, demanding that they take care of them, which I find absolutely uh, ridiculous in, in and, so and many that, levels. Yeah, and so that in that case, if you don't take responsibility for yourself, then someone else, like the government, would take it, and that is fueling your opposition. That That's why exactly. you think personal response. That's the link, the connection, right? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, so let me, let, let me ask you something. So I'm increasingly using these conversations to clarify my own thinking about something. So we're going to do tactical training tomorrow. So I've seen around your, your place here, you have a bunch of guns. I also have a bunch of guns. My house is very American. The, our non-American audience will be horrified by that. But you have, I'm looking right on your desk. Hold that up if you don't mind the uh, stun gun there. Oh, yeah, yeah. We have, uh, we have brass knuckles. We have the stun gun. Yeah. We have other other stuff here that we probably shouldn't be showing on camera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so so I have loaded Glocks in my place, and uh, I don't have a sun gun. I should perhaps get them in mace. So tell me, in just in a very clear way, you know that the people say, explain it to me like I'm five. Why is taking responsibility for your own safety important, either important to you or important, period? Because no one's going to keep you safe. No one's going to protect you. No one's really going to look out for you other than than you, and uh, especially if you know you're, you're a man, you got to understand. There's a lot of crazy people out there. There's a lot of individuals out there that are monsters. They're sociopaths. They're individuals that routinely take lives, and they do it in an absolute careless way. And uh, those individuals, there's a lot more of them than than we actually know about. There's actually more uh, sociopaths per capita in Washington D.C. than anywhere else yeah, in the United I, I, States. Yeah. And um, just even looking at the latest footage coming from Russia with that mass shooting in the oh, concert yeah. hall, yeah, yeah. you see so many individuals that are just shocked, that are scared, that are in a corner, and these monsters, these in, in incredulous, sociopathic, destructive human beings are just shooting into them. And then there's people just with the blank stare, just not knowing what to do. There was, there was another situation where uh, they were also chased in the bathroom, and then the, a whole bunch yeah, of people yeah. were shot in the bathroom. All it could I have would taken. never have run into a bathroom, just by the way. Exactly. Uh, really bad uh, decision and move here. And uh, it, it would have just taken one trained individual 
could have stopped them. These these guys were these guys were moving forward. They weren't watching their their back. They were just kind of moving forward, doing whatever they wanted to, because the population was left defenseless. I I don't want to ever be in that situation. I don't want my family to ever be in that situation. The world is dangerous. Life is worth protecting. If you're going to have a fire extinguisher because you think there's going to be a fire, you should have a right to defend yourself as well, just like you do that fire extinguisher. It's that simple for me. As of course, this world is dangerous. This world is crazy. And with the way that things are going in our society, they're only going to get a lot crazier from here. So maybe you can help me. And I'm, at, I'm not being facetious when I ask you this. I'm being incredibly sincere when I ask you this question. Maybe you can help me understand. And I have asked a lot of people. In fact, I've asked Reed this question repeatedly. I've asked a lot of people this question. What is the thinking? Why would somebody not want to carry a gun or with a concealed carrier, have a weapon or have a stun gun or have mace or train in jujitsu. Like why would somebody want to, I'm trying not to, I'm trying not to um, rig the words that I use. And it's very difficult for me because I have such a strong opinion on this. I, I, so I'll just tell you some of the phrases that are go going through head. Like, be held hostage to a maniac, or be a victim, or run the, think that the odds are so low it will never happen so they don't have to do any of it. Like, what would the thinking of somebody be for the fact that they will simply take no response, not even like pepper spray? Like, why, what would be going through someone's head for that? Because for the life of me, that is just completely the opposite of how I live my life. Uh, delusion, privilege. And just having it too good for too long. Traveling the world, you kind of realize just how dangerous the world is. In, in so America... I've had the exact opposite, yeah. by the way. Traveling the world, I'm like, fucking, this country is way more fucking dangerous exactly. than, like, mo yeah. Exactly. Like, I've, I've, you know, spent a lot of time in a lot of crazy places, places like Somalia, where, uh, you know, in Mogadishu, you, you got to yeah, sign yeah. your next of kin just to, just to get into a hotel. So the, the, there's, there's so many situations outside of the world that you start to get a perspective on just how violent, just how dangerous things could get at any moment at any time. Traveling the world really does kind of make you aware of, of our kind of existence and what it truly kind of um, okay. is. So, so, and again, I'm being incredibly sincere when I ask you this question. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out somebody who does not, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you and I, you're thinking about this in a way that I'm very similar to the way that I'm thinking about. It. Like, I don't want to be in a situation where I'm held hostage to some fucking savage. I don't want to be in a situation where someone I love is like terrified. Because I, I've do jujitsu and I've been there, and I every time I'm thinking to myself, oh my god, if I couldn't tap, I can't even fathom how horrific. Like heart horrific it would be that someone just like tortures me to death. I mean, that would just be just, why is it that people are willing to, to open themselves? Is, is it like, why would somebody even want it? Is it, is it that somebody who doesn't take steps to prevent that? Is it that they think that the possibility of that happening to them is so utterly minuscule that they shouldn't even buy pepper spray? Is that what's going through their head? I don't think they even think about it. I, I think they're privileged. I think they're naive. And, and I think they also have this kind of viewpoint that the state will protect me. The government will protect me. The police officers will protect me. Now, now granted, there are some amazing, incredible police officers that, that do risk their lives and try to help people sometimes. But I, I remember doing a, a story about this a couple of years ago because I met a guy at a bar called Joe Lazito, and he was introduced to me through a friend and this is a man that literally uh, stopped a serial killer in New York City. But in response to doing so, he was stabbed multiple times all throughout his body as police officers were literally standing by and watching this whole incident unfold with guns, with batons. And they literally waited and, and almost made him lose his life as, of course, they, they stopped train, as, of course, they only intervened when Joe actually took this guy down, beat him up, and was able to subdue him as he was bleeding everywhere. And then Joe kind of wakes up in the hospital miraculously as he does. And then there's a press conference where literally the mayor is saying that he was a victim and that these police officers were the brave heroes here that stopped this serial killer that was killing people all throughout New York City. Mm. That wasn't the case. That wasn't the truth at all. 
uh, Joe sued the police department and the police department literally argued the whole protect and serve thing. That's just a slogan. It doesn't mean we have to do it. And then a court ruled, as many courts in the United States have ruled, the police have no duty to protect and serve you at that all. That sounds like something Ted Wheeler, he, him, his would say. Absolutely. And, and, this is, and this is an experience that a lot of people face, a lot of people deal with, and it's a horrible situation. And it's a horrible experience because a lot of the times you're depending on random strangers to kind of intervene and help you and save your life and risk in their own lives. Many times that doesn't happen. And that's the reality of human life that a lot of people don't expect to hear the harsh kind of language okay. and consequences of. Okay, so what I'm hearing from you, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that the people who live their lives in a way that they take literally no responsibility for their own self-defense whatsoever... Those people are either depending on the state to help them if something, some maniac comes, or, or, or they're, they're relying upon a random bystander to have a gun or to have done the work and to intervene. Like, is that what they're thinking? I, it, it's hard to even get in the mind of these people. But, but I think even hearing about cases like Uvalde and, and Parkland have highlighted particular incidences where police officers are just literally standing back and, and then families are literally told, yeah, there's a killer there killing your children, but uh, we're just going to stand back here. And, th and that situation, I think, shocks a lot of people. But okay, so you, so, and, and again, I don't want to put words in, I'm trying to figure this out. So you think that those people just simply don't think about it at all? Yeah. And they just well, walk through their life thinking, you know, about what I'm going to eat tomorrow or this hot girl or guy or whatever there, or what's on TV or where I'm going to buy marijuana or whatever it is, but it just doesn't occur to them. I don't think so. I don't, I don't think they, they think about it. I, I, I think a lot of them really think that, you know, okay, the so, cops, the cops, you know, will okay. protect me if anything happens. Okay. So then let me ask you this question then. Let's say something were to happen to those people. They'd be raped. They'd be brutalized. What have you. Why is it that then, given that that happened to them, they then don't get a concealed carry, buy a mace, train in jiu-jitsu, or some combat? Like, why is it even after that, is it because they they then revert to thinking that it's such a low po probability that they don't even have to think of Is it the same kind of fallacy that got them to be a victim in the first place? Not always. I, th I think a lot of those incidences make people kind of change as well. I, I think those incidences wake a lot of people up and, and do turn them on towards the larger ideas of, hey, I, I got to take my health seriously. Hey, I should really learn how to you know defend myself during these situations. And uh, you look at a lot of people who are bullied. A lot of them, a lot of people who are bullied are usually the ones who are kind of spurred on to, to take yeah. a lot of this kind of self-defense more seriously, which is absolutely critically important because I think there's also a larger kind of energetic component to this as well. Um, I, I remember in New York City seeing a lot of you know criminality, seeing a lot of criminals, and, and essentially what I saw was a kind of larger predator class, a larger criminal class looking at people and kind of sensing their energy, sensing their vibes. Yeah. Some people just had this victimhood energy around them where they made the perfect targets. They made individuals that the, the, the robber knew they're not going to resist. They're not going to fight me. I could just see in the way that they walk. I could just yep. feel their presence. I could see there energetically that these are the these are the prey that are going to be very easy to to, to take out. But if you practice self defense, if you learn how to, if you learn how to defend yourself, if you if you become stronger by weightlifting, you, you build up a certain confidence, but you also build up a certain kind of frequency and energy, where that that energy isn't and felt by those pred response, predators, right? Exactly. Yeah. And and knowing what to do during those fight or flight moments, which I I, I challenge myself every week with with that with this kind of high intensity tactical training that you're going. To to be doing tomorrow that's really fun and really awesome i'm also uh figuring out a way to make this class kind of public for uh, uh audience members and people of the general public because i think this is something that's crucially important because it's not just giving people confidence but it's also making them and it, this sounds crazy and this sounds woo, -woo energetically less likely to become victims in the future no it doesn't i went to a seminar with paul sharp and he said exactly that about how people, the, the, the quote unquote bad guys identify victims, how they, I mean, we, we don't have to talk about this, but it's something I've been thinking about. Do, do, can I ask you a personal question? Sure. Do you have kids? No. Do you want kids? Yes. Would you, do you think it's important that you teach your daughter basic kind of situational awareness? 100%. Absolutely. Okay. What would you say about a father 
who did not do that. They aren't personally responsible, and they're leading to a situation where their loved one, their daughter, could be hurt severely. And I, I, I think a lot of women get a lot of different propaganda today that's very dangerous to them. There's a lot of entertainment that puts in a lot of subliminal kind of context and messaging in there that creates a form of delusion that is absolutely reckless, that is absolutely dangerous. And if you truly do care about women, you would care about self-defense rights, and, and you would care about the ability to defend yourself, which in places like New York City, you don't have that ability to okay. do. So what is your response to a woman who would say, well, I shouldn't have to defend myself. It's 2024. Uh, men shouldn't be doing this anymore. Let's hear that message in New Delhi, India. Let's hear that message in a lot of other Latin American countries. Let's hear that message in, in Saudi Arabia, as, of course, uh, a lot of those individuals are uh, literally being walked in, into the United States with the Biden administration and their kind of policies. There's, there's people in this world that should obviously respect people, that, should, that shouldn't hurt people, but that's not the reality of the world. There's a lot of bad people out there that just don't respect women, that don't care about women, and this is why it should be advantageous for them to be able to defend themselves against these larger kind of predators and monsters out there. Mm. It's, it's a harsh world, but... It's a world that we're all living in, and you could either be a victim of it or you, you could be someone that defends yourself against it and fights for the larger kind of individuality, the larger kind of prosperity, the larger kind of um, aspects of it that are worth fighting for. And mm. if you don't fight for yourself, you know, just like your rights, just like your muscles, if you don't use it, you lose it. So yeah, I think it's absolutely critically important for, for women to learn to defend themselves, especially in an ever, ever so dangerous world. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change topics on you. Do you have a best friend? As of not, uh, now, no. But you did. I think I did, yeah. yeah. W and what happened there? Uh, grew apart. And um, you still friendly with them? Yeah, but you, they're not. It's not the same. No, no. The first friend that comes to mind was my friend in uh, New York City that I grew up with. Um, but he was also caught up in a lot of like, you know, not not the best of stuff. And then I took a different path in life. Was it an ideological dispute? No, it was. It's just time and space. He's in New York City. I'm in Florida. I traveled. He wasn't traveling, and uh, we just kind of fell apart that way. Mm. You know, what would you like to talk about? But we, we do have, uh, you know, opening slots for Luke's best friend. If anyone's interested, they could fill in their opening applications. Spots, there you go. Um, oh, we, we can talk about a, a wide ranging what, uh, amount of mind? topics. What's, what's on your mind? A read if you have any intent, just throw it out. The thing that comes to mind is, is trying to make people understand how life is short. And it's it's a lot better. It's a lot. It's it, it's so much more fun. It's so much more interesting once you start doing things on your own. Once you start creating your own businesses. Once you start building, making. Yeah. Once you start creating your own path for yourself in this life, and uh, a lot of people are kind of just kind of stuck with listening to what what society tells them to do. A lot of people are kind of stuck with just doing the easy thing, but. Doing the easy thing really isn't easy. It's one of the worst things you could be doing for yourself as an individual. Challenge yourself. Test yourself. Take on a new skill. Take on a new challenge. Your brain literally grows and becomes stronger once you start learning new languages, new skills, new things that as you age, you, you kind of lose the ability to do. So, how do, you, how do you figure out how to triage that? Like, which more important? Learn a new language or, I don't know, do another live stream or... It, it depends on yeah. It depends on the situation. Or, yeah. It it depends on what kind of drives you, what challenges you, what what do you really like to do? And um, I really love tactical training. I, I really love that stuff. I I really love learning. I really love reading. I really I really love sharing what I learned with people. I, I like teaching. And what, what, what would uh, it take what for you on. to shoot someone? It's a very interesting question. Um, If they were going to take my life or the life of a loved one. If my life was threatened or the life of a loved one was threatened. Not if they were just stealing your property? I got to be, you know, careful with my language here. Um, but again, property uh, could be replaced. A lot of the times, um, if you look at a lot of the confrontations, a lot of the fights, a lot of the, the kind of homicides out there, a lot of them happen because of ego, because of pride, because people mm. don't walk away. Mm. 
and uh, it, yeah, I'm amazed how many I, I, I yeah. I'm amazed how many I see they could be completely diffused in a second, and they're not. And people lose their lives very easily, even without guns, even without knives, just by being kicked in the head when they're on the ground, which happens all the time. Yeah, and that's yeah. the I just want to comment on that because I think it's so important. People do not understand the damage one punch that one punch to the head can kill you. Absolutely. Yeah, you fall down, you crack your head open, you're you're dead, and it happens a lot. And uh, people don't understand just the, the propensity towards just crazy total violence. Uh, life is worth protecting, but I believe a lot of the stuff that, that kind of happens, and if you're someone that, that kind of believes in, in personal self-defense and protecting life, you should be willing to walk away from a lot of those situations. And by doing a lot of the training that we do, we specifically prioritize not putting yourself in a situation where you're drunk or you're arguing or you're fighting mm. over a parking lot spot because if you're armed, it's fine. Take the spot. It's okay. I'll find a new parking spot. That's the new kind of approach that you need to have. Uh, you can't be a hothead. You got to be someone that could control their emotions. You got to be someone who is able to be reasonable and someone that needs a ton of practice and a ton of discipline. And uh, yeah. if, if it, and Truly, if someone's taking, if someone threatens, if someone is in the process of trying to take away my life or the life of my loved one, I will defend what myself. What causes and my you to one. lose your temper? I don't know. When's the last time you lost your temper? I'm trying to think. I don't remember. I, I can't really. There's times where I get kind of like. Frustrated. There's times that I get, you know, sad, mm. uh, disappointed, you know. But I, n- I never really kind of blow a casket. And if and if I do feel like a large sense of like anger, I usually meditate or I just hit the gym and I hit the weights and I try to get it out that way. And that usually works. But if you're going to be someone who you know carries or has a firearm, you can't be someone who loses their cool all the time. Um, and uh, yeah, I feel I, I feel disappointment, you know, sometimes, in people around me, um, you know. But you mean just you just you feel disappointed by people? I, I made I made I, I'm I'm talking about one particular kind of personal thing that's been going on recently that I probably shouldn't expound okay, on. Don't do on, anything on here. uncomfortable with. Uh, that that also is kind of you know, but but I don't I don't want I don't want to get into all that stuff. But I but I do feel that uh, you know if, if you are taking self defense seriously, you gotta know when to of course walk away and i think uh training encompasses all of that and teaches you how to how to do that in many instances well, and so not to act on on kind of fear so what's the opposite of being disappointed white pilled optimistic uh, excited isn't the opposite of that pessimistic yeah i, w- I would confer the two to be kind of similar So I, I I can't do this without the word. So I'm not buying. I'm not thinking it's optimistic. I'm not thinking it's because uh, I was I was going to ask you what somebody has done recently that's caused you to be the opposite of disappointment, whatever that word would be. But I can't. I don't know the word. What it would be. I'm trying to think as well. What, what what's something someone has done, but it also has to have been satisfied or pleased, but it also has to have an element of. Oh, I, I was going to say surprise, but maybe not. What's some something someone's done in your life that satisfied or pleased you recently? And I think it also has to have an element of being unexpected, somewhat unexpected, don't you? Delighted. What someone so, something's del, that, what's delighted you that. The behavior of someone, I think, just joking around with people, just just being able to have fun on the show. Mm-hmm. Um, Clint, Clint is a great example. He's a good sport. We have a lot of fun. I usually start off the video describing one of his new girlfriends, so it, it it's fun that he kind of uh, you know plays along with that, and I enjoy that kind of like witty kind of comedic banter. Toby Turner is also here. He's he's a ridiculous human being who's also pretty funny. <laughs> And pretty all over the place, and I've been enjoying um, just being very kind of facetious and, and, and kind of comedic with him, and just just uh, being very blunt with him, and, and just having moments where we just kind of like laugh over mm. the, like, the silliness of, of a lot of stuff. So having those kind of moments 
uh, definitely brings a lot of joy and happiness to me. Do you think people understand you more who are in the space you're in? They have to. I mean, we deal with the same kind of like criticisms, pressures, the same kind of uh, reward systems. There's yeah. there's a lot of parallels. So obviously, I mean, it's just in, common. We're, we're we're in like Venn diagrams. Our Venn diagrams are touching, but they're not really overlapping. What you and I do. Yeah. Which is interesting and, and fascinating because there's a whole like entire world that, that I could probably open you up to it and you could probably do the same in, in your world. That would be very uh, interesting and that would be very um, thought-provoking. Are, are you... So... Are you happy about all the moral beliefs you hold? I never really thought about it as far as my kind of emotional reaction to it. Um, we... we, we so you, you, you hold your moral beliefs because you, you think they're true? Yes. And are there any moral beliefs you hold that make you uncomfortable? No, I don't think so. No. How do you know then that the moral beliefs you hold, you're not holding because they make you comfortable? That's true. And that's definitely worth kind of larger self-examination into what you actually believe, what you stand for. I did notice an overall, uh, an overwhelming kind of theme in uh, my kind of independent media journey. It's always been for free speech. It's always been anti-war. It's always been for the decentralization of power and authority and, and the, the ability of individuals just to be able to kind of live their lives freely. So th those are the kind of overwhelming themes that you always kind of see that haven't flip-flopped or switched based on emotions or different events based on different kind of tribes and different kind of gangs and different kind of political mm. ideologies. So I had uh, Chris Matthews of MSNBC call me a jihad-loving liberal. No, sorry. <laughs> that, was, that, was, um, that was actually, what's his name, the Fox guy. That called me. Uh, what's his name? That that that. Uh, Bill O'Reilly. Bill O'Reilly yeah. called, called me uh, a jihad-loving uh, liberal. Chris Matthews of MSNBC called me a right-wing racist teabagger. I'm obviously none of those things. I, I like to to espouse the ideas that I do, and then when they become inconvenient to a bunch of people, they usually like to pin labels on me. But if you could pin any label on me, is that I'm pro pro freedom, pro free speech, anti-war. Um, and, and those are the things that I have, I have always stood behind, always resonated. I questioned my kind of stance, stances b behind those issues a lot. I challenged myself on those issues a lot. But, but looking at the overall kind of trajectory of the world and how events played out, I think those were the right decisions to have. Are your friends mostly pro-freedom, pro-free speech, pro-liberty people? Yes. Okay. I, I, I do have a couple... Uh, commie friends that uh, sometimes I, I congregate with that are interesting to uh, listen to and, and to talk to. Okay. So bear with me for this question. It's a little weird. <laughs> Unlike the rest of the questions that I asked you are perfectly normal. So let's say that there are two people and both of whom, b there are two people, both of whom share your beliefs about freedom and freedom of speech from you know cognitive liberty etc but one of those people says yes i believe this because it's true but i really wished i didn't believe it and the other one said i believe it's true and i'm happy i believe it would there be any qualitative difference in the way you treated them or in the, those relationships i would try to find find out why i would try to understand them um w which one both of them yeah, I would want to know, and I would I would want to understand their kind of larger their thoughts, their passions, wh why they came to those conclusions mm -hmm. uh, personally themselves. Uh, both arguments are, are are valid and probably something that I went through in my head as well. So I don't think I would treat any of them differently because as a human being, you kind of have different emotions and you have different reactions to to different things. Sometimes you're a little bit more optimistic. Sometimes you're pessimistic. Sometimes you have a lot of hope in humanity. Sometimes you look and you just think idiocracy and Wally is inevitable. Mm. And uh, it, it really does depend on the mood, what you're around, wh what you surround yourself with, and, and j just random circumstances and situations in this world that you're put in. So assuming that, you know, AGI doesn't take over, aliens don't come, or there's no mass nuclear war, what have you, assuming kind of some stability in the system, where do you see yourself at 57? Family, bunch of kids, 
And um, I think doing what I'm doing now, hosting interesting, interesting conversations, learning, and uh, doing more, um, doing more kind of work regarding having more personal responsibility, having my own kind of farm, having at least a cow or two, uh, maybe some sheep, maybe some chickens. Uh, we're in the process of trying to get chickens here now. J- having having a, a, a way where I could make my own food, having a way where I have my own family, having a way where I could still do what I love and, and probably still be doing this. Hmm. Do you have any questions for me? Anything that's on your mind to think about? Um, you've been you've been in this you know sphere for for a while. What do you think are some of the things that uh, I should be aware of or careful uh, as far as navigating this plane of life? Professionally, you mean? Yeah. Um, that's a really interesting question. Um, and if it's too in the weeds, you don't have to answer it. Of no, no, no. Yeah. I, I I think that there are some people who do what we do, I, it always sounds so pretentious, but really the best way to describe it really is public intellectuals, but I hate to say that. Um, it's not quite a YouTuber because they usually do other things, give talks, panels, debates, fireside, maybe write a book or maybe... Just, so it's not exactly a YouTuber. So really the public intellectuals. I found a lot of people in this space are just full of shit. Mm-hmm. So I would say try to figure out who's full of shit and who's not. Yeah. That I think is important. And and a lot of those people I think are fundamentally insincere. Yes. But they know how to grow an audience. Yeah. They know um, how to give a sound bite. There's a lot of grifters as well. Yeah, there there are a lot of of, of um there are a lot of people who will say things or either I want to say they'll say things they don't believe, but they'll convince themselves. They'll run down rabbit holes because they know that they'll have audience capture or that their audience captured. I think that's one thing. I think that I think that the other thing is, God, I have met so I have met so many smart people, like like legitimately smart people who do what I do. So uh, there used to be a um, this. Uh, philosophers in Oregon thing that, that philosophers in Oregon used to go to there. If you're a professor of philosophy, you'd go and I, I remember going to these events, this guy would cook Indian food. And I just remember to being like, wow, like these guys. And then there's the speed, the, the, the people with whom I engage on a regular basis. I mean, there was just like light. I mean, there was just no comparison. Like, um, th- there's no, there was no like, intellectual jockeying at certain you know when you talk to like Dawkins or there's still just no jockeying he's just a dude like he drove Reed and I on his Tesla and and I think that there's there's a kind of um there's a kind of hyper self consciousness good dog there's a kind of hyper self consciousness uh, among people like they don't want to be wrong they don't want to be seen to be wrong so I guess my 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 unsolicited advice to you, well, my solicited since you asked me, would be um, figure out who's sincere and who's not. Don't hang out with the insincere people. When when you're on a show, if someone convinces you of something, just say, "Wow, like I never thought of that. I'll think about it and change my mind." Uh, I think people really respect that when you change your mind in real time, as, as long as it's sincere. Um, but yeah, and then I would say, like, in terms of a relationship, something I've been thinking about a lot, I think it's really important that the person, if, if you're in a relationship with someone, at the very least, they have to understand what you do and support you. And I don't mean like, oh, you know, good job, honey. You know, like, but they have to understand why you're doing it. Hmm. So that's what I would say. Interesting. And any things you recommend to avoid any of those kind of pitfalls? Um, well, figuring out who's sincere and who's insincere is tricky. Yeah. There's um, a lot of good sociopaths out there that are able to yeah, put I'm on thinking, a good face. I'm thinking of one person in particular who moves at very high level in the space I'm in. But can, can you name them? No, I cannot. <laughs> I cannot. Um, he, but the, I think a telltale sign is trying to identify it, and I think obfuscation is a, is, a, is a key 
way. If someone is is obfuscating, they're almost definitely full of shit. Um, I just can't stand to be around these people. And there's this kind of weird kind of a jockeying of of of, of things. I, I've never really understood why why people do that. Um, oh, and so so I'm sure you get a mad amount of shit about you know people saying crazy shit to you and to people fuck them. Yeah. I mean, if you want not, make, not literally, not no, 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 definitely not. Uh, you know, if you well, want to make, make, make like, a substantive argument about what I have to say, I'll engage it. If not, you just can't take these people seriously. I mean, I just don't take any of these people seriously. Yeah. And the problem with not taking them seriously is because we need that feedback to improve, to align our thoughts and cognitions with reality. And because these people, they they all tend to be the, of the kind of a very similar personality type too you know, under accomplished or they think they should have accomplished more and they haven't and they have a kind of resentment a kind of Yeah. You gotta be um, careful not to be infatuated just by the positivity and the love yeah. and, and all that. You need someone to also ground you and keep you real and then just be like, Hey, you're fucking up here, or this is pretty shitty here, you could do a better job here. And it's difficult for a lot of people to kind yeah. of interface with that because they're just used to love, 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 and then getting love bombed by the audience, but not really dealing with the consequences yeah. of like, 100%. Hey, I gotta make sure my own shit's pretty taken care of well, not in a way where it's just uh kind of obnoxious or just uh self aggrandizing. Yeah. So that would be the other thing I would say is take any disagreement w that you have with someone to someone personally, as opposed to like posting on their YouTube co co channel, go, like, you know, saying that nasty shit about them on Twitter. That actually tells, tells you more about them than it does you. So take it to someone personally, but you know, you're a smart guy. I think it's, it's pretty easy to figure this stuff out. It's just very difficult to suss out insincere people, it, it's very difficult to suss out people who are just frauds. Yeah. Well, eventually you you kind of do see it and you get screwed over by them. And there's been incidences where I've been screwed over in this movement and it's and it's like, motherfucker, like, yeah. fuck, I can't believe you did this. Um, dastardly, like, evil shit sometimes. And um, a, a lot of the stuff I don't like to talk about because I don't like drama. I don't like fights. I don't, yeah, like, yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't want the I'm a victim hood kind of thing to be perpetrated here. And, uh, yeah, I, it, it, it's tough because, you know, again, I, I don't mean just to be like, oh, it's tough, it's hard. No, no, it's actually an incredible um, privilege that we have to be able to have these kind of jobs totally. and opportunities to read and learn and to share what yeah. we, I, I believe I'm extremely fucking lucky um, and, uh, and extremely privileged. And um, what we have to deal with, a lot of the general public doesn't have to deal with as well. It's different. Some yeah. people like to say, oh, it's worse. Some it's better. I don't think you, you can even quantify it like that. I'm just very lucky to have an audience, and I do everything in my power to try to give them as much kind of knowledge and information and uh, data and entertainment and, and ability to laugh sometimes to uh, offset a lot of the kind of harshness of the world that... Um, we have to live more and more in reality of. Yeah. Do you have any advice for me? I'll get bounce your question back to me. I, I, I don't know if we want to talk about some of the personal stuff that we talked about in the beginning. Um, uh, not I, The only thing I don't talk yeah. about is my personal life. Yeah. I know. We, we don't have to get in there. I, I, I would say th there's also an, another kind of like spiritual kind of non-scientific aspect of this mm. that I think is worth exploring. And, and I know, you know, you're an atheist and, and you have your kind of point of view, but I think that there is something larger out there. And this is my point of view. And I could just be kind of saying it in order to kind of rationalize it for myself. But the, but there is the, the woo woo stuff, the hippie stuff, the all all the stuff, especially when it comes to things like the placebo effect, I, I do believe is real. And, and I do believe there there might be a possibility that there's another kind of thing to look at that that might be more advantageous for this kind of life journey that that would be uh, maybe coming from a, a more curious place that that might be worth examining but but i just you know i just really met you for the first time so i don't know i'm just going off that kind of conversation second that time. we had yeah second time we met on timcast when you were there uh in austin texas with us um yes yeah, we, so got off, we got off well yeah yeah no it was, it was great um but uh, the hippie woo woo stuff there's a lot to it Mm. And and I, I don't know your your thoughts and ideas on it. I just know that you just said you're kind of an atheist. But I, I think there's something absolutely deeper, something more spiritual, something else that science and, and humanity can't quantify, but it's there. 
Hmm. And I think it's worth sometimes deep diving and examining and and hmm. and, and uh, trying to feel in its fullest. Hmm. But that's just my unsolicited. No, no, I'm glad you said advice. that. Anything else? No, I, th- I think we covered it. I think we went through a lot of. Uh, no, I meant advice for me, suggestions. I, w- I would have to definitely talk to you more uh, right. and get and get to know you more. That that was just kind of my like knee, knee jerk kind of reaction to this. But uh, other than that, I, no, no, I think uh, you made a lot of solid arguments, a lot of good solid uh, discussions during the, oh, the, the podcast the show that yeah. we just did, which was which was great. It was really awesome, and it you know challenged me and it made me think about stuff that I. Ru- huh. wouldn't routinely think about like what i'm just now okay like, like when we were on the show you, you were like why why do you believe this or like why 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 did you come to this kind of conclusion here oh, oh. um and then it's like okay well let's let's kind of revert back to the the founding of where mm. i kind of came from or where these ideas kind of festered and grew to where they are now oh. um and i and i think it's important to, to do that and um it, it's important once in a once in a while to take a step back and kind of examine stuff from its origin. And uh, I don't think a lot of people cool. do that a lot. Well, well thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, no worries. Oh, cool. Well, thanks, thanks for the conversation. Thanks, thanks for having me. Appreciate right on, it. Thanks. All right. Thank you for watching. Everything we do is under the umbrella of the National Progress Alliance, nationalprogressalliance.org. It's a nonprofit, independent 501c3. Your generous donations keep us going and keep fueling content like this. So please help us out, make a donation. We very much appreciate it. Thank you.